three. There you go. Um, all right, so then before we get started on new stuff, do you have any questions about the, the NMR lab? Uh, not yet. Okay. I mean, actually, I'm actually wondering about the previous lab where they asked to calculate the K U. Um, I know that's like uh, concentration over concentration. Um, but if I was like looking a uh, review for it and it mm -hmm. said you don't include like liquids or solids. Correct, because they have a constant concentration. And so that doesn't factor into the equilibrium constant, as odd as that seems. Um, so all of all of the things are either liquid or solid, but so, not once they're reacting. Okay. So, uh, so if one of your reactants is the liquid that then dissolves the solid, the liquid is the solvent. As long as you have more moles of liquid than you do of the solid. Okay, so, so, so I found, I did find a concentration uh, with whatever like liquid we began with, mm -hmm. and then uh, the liquid we used in purification. I wasn't sure if I did it right, but I did like the um, one gram of product that was started with in the 12.8 milliliters Good. converted to liters. Good. Um, and then the purification step, um, I used like a mass of what we measured the product to be after purification and like vacuum filtration. Um, and I used the 20 milliliters of water that was used in the purification step to find the, uh, the concentration. And I just was very unsure of myself. So, so there's no reaction happening on the purification step, right? Yeah. So if there's no reaction happening, then that's not really, it's, you can think of it as solubility as being equilibrium, but it's not really a product of a reactant situation because there's nothing changing, okay. right? The whole idea with the, with the recrystallization is you dissolve it and then undissolve it. Yeah. So you end in the same state that you started. Okay. I just thought that would be where I would have like all of the products at that point. So it would all be in that solution. So are you talking well, about what would I use for the uh, are you talking about just P, just five here or was there did it show up later too? No. Uh just just five, just finding the K here. So all it's really asking for. It says to write the expression for it, which doesn't necessarily mean that you need a number. Did not know that. So the mathematical expression would just be concentration of products over concentration of reactants, leaving off the, sol the any solids or liquids. Okay. So so with that and so all they're really asking is like, okay, well, what could you do to get it to favor reactants by either raising one of these concentrations or dropping one of these concentrations um, in order to maximize your yield is what it was looking for. So it's a good review to go back in and do that, but that was beyond what it was looking for. That I, question. I think I had, um, I think I had both of it. I don't remember if it's reactants over products or products over reactants. Products over reactants, always. Um, okay, yeah, and I did the, the Amino benzoic acid over the benzoate, and I just like wrote that in brackets and like a little fraction, and then I actually tried to find the concentration. But that's the part that I wasn't sure if I did that. Gotcha. Yeah. So it would get hard to figure out what that K was. But actually, you did, you probably went about that, right? To get your concentration of benzocaine, you, you take the amount that you ended up with at the end. And make that your and find your concentration of the fat for your products. And then you have your concentration of um, the paraamino benzoic acid that you have as your reactant. So that's on the bottom. So anything you can do to, to increase 
your concentration of the paraphenobenzoic acid or decrease your concentration of the product is going to help you move towards completion, get you better yield. So if you have some way of removing water, water is a product, right? Yeah. Um, if you have a way of removing water, or if you have a way of, of having extra um, extra alcohol, or and that's not necessarily going to affect it as much because that's the solvent, so it wouldn't show up in your equilibrium constant. Um, but yeah, so so it's, it was you overthought it a little bit, but I'm. Mean, I think you you went about it the right way to try to answer the question you thought I was asking. Yeah. All right, so then we'll leave alone the um, 2D NMR for now. We'll have time during lab for some questions on that as well. Um, because we'll talk in lab today, we're going to be talking more about um, what our final project looks like, which I'm realizing we should have probably started this several weeks ago at this point. Um, but so it's going to be a little bit more limited in than, than what I was originally thinking, but I'll have more details for that. That's all our last labs are going to be today's lab planning something out and then next couple of weeks labs to try and try and actually do a project. Um, and I have some some options, so it's not entirely on you to do the planning since we're starting so late. Um, it'll be it are both couple week long labs. Um, that would that would fit the bill for this. So we'll talk about. So today what we're going to talk about is uh, is alpha carbons. So this is really the last major topic in in first year OCHEM, um, and it's basically it's more carbonyl chemistry, but it's it's the carbon next to the carbonyl it has very specific reactions as well, especially aldehydes and ketones, that alpha carbon has, has fairly unique properties because of the formation of, uh, of enols and enolates. Um, but just to review a little bit of the synthesis portion um, for this is that figure we used for uh, figuring out what to do um, for synthesis for carbonyls. And this is this is in the chapter. I think it's section. Um, I don't remember. It's, there's a section. It's the second to last section says synthesis of carbonyl of carboxylic acid derivatives or synthesis strategies or something like that. Um, and the the main thing that we've added that we should pay attention to. So we we did some practice where we moved back and forth between all the different acid derivatives. Um, and but probably the most unique thing that we're adding at this point is that we have the ability to do um, to do a, re a reduction of our carboxylic acid derivative that stops at the aldehyde rather than going all the way to the primary alcohol. Um, and then we also had a way, it's not shown here, but we also had a way to add just a single alkyl group to reduce it as well. So we had two reductions that went just one step that didn't go both steps. So Grignard reaction or lithium aluminum hydride takes us all the way from an acid derivative all the way to the primary alcohol. If we wanted to reduce it partly, we either have to use the um, Dibaw, the diisobutyl aluminum hydride, um, to add a hydride, and that stops at the aldehyde. Or if we took carboxylic acid and we used a uh, Gilman reagent, which is that lithium cuprate. So L I C U R, whatever the R group is, gets added, but just one of them. So you wind up with. A ketone, but it only does the one step, which gives us the ability to, to um, 
that gives us a lot of flexibility when it, because we started talking about aldehydes and ketones, we have a lot of reactions with aldehydes and ketones. And I think we'll leave this as a um, as some practice problems. We won't go through all of these right now. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> right now. Um, but here's some more practice problems. These are from the textbook. I want to say. Um, I'm going to say that the first two are from whatever chapter carboxylic acids are in, I think it was 21. Um, number 32 are these first ones. And this last one, I think, was 21.68 or 6.9. Just so you have some reference. So let's see. No, chapter twenty. So it's chapter 20, number 69C was the third one. And I'm fairly certain it was thirty-two. Maybe just 30. Hang on. Yeah, there it is. 32. 20.32. All right. So just because those are those are good good review questions because they're you have to remember all of our reactions um, to know all of your tools. Uh, and I do have the solutions manual that you can check your answers in, or we can go over them in, in lab. So we'll let those marinate for a minute. I'll let you finish copying them down. Um, and then we'll talk about one new concept and then after after we take a break later, we'll come back and spend some time thinking about these. Yeah. All right, so just a recap of the the nomenclature for using the Greek letters. Um, when we're talking about carbon yield compounds, and this is where it got a little bit hazy. I think we first came across this this term. Um, when we were talking about uh, alkyl halides, we were talking about the alpha carbon as the one that has the halogen attached to it. And remember, I, I kind of said, this seems, I think that they're using this wrong. This is the proper way to use the, uh, the Greek letters, is the functional group would just be the carbonyl carbon or the alkyl halide carbon. The alpha carbon is one removed from that. And then you, you basically just start the Greek alphabet from there. Um, and it's very rarely would we go past delta at the most. Um, once you get past that, you start using just regular Arabic numerals. Um, so, and just to recap, since we haven't been using these that much, alpha, beta, oops, and that one, That looks like that. That's a, a uh, gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, delta are the first four. If you have up to four carbons past the carbonyl carbon, 
that accounts for um, being able to make ring formation reactions happen because if we had something happening, if we had something attached on the delta carbon and it came over and reacted there or reacted with the with the carbonyl carbon, you could make a ring structure. And so we do see that sometimes that terminology. In fact, I just came across it over the weekend um, when I took Dash into the urgent care to get antibiotics for his ears. Um, the I was looking up the structure of penicillin because I remember that it had a sulfur in it somewhere. And I was trying to remember what the structure looked like. And it's called a beta lactam is the type of molecule that penicillin is. Um, and that's a, a lactam is a cyclic amide. Um, and it, it's a beta lactam because of where the nitrogen and the carbonyl are attached on the molecule relative to each other. I mean, it's, when it's open chain form, it looks something like like this, which can react to form a four-sided ring, a four-sided um, cyclic amide. So it would look something like Then there's a bunch of other stuff attached as well, but that that's referred to as a beta lactam because the nitrogen is attached on the beta carbon relative to the that carboxylic acid relative to the carbonyl carbon. So it's that same nomenclature. Um, a lot of times in medication or um, or biochemistry in general, when you see the Greek letters showing up. It's either referring to this style of nomenclature or the other place it shows up is um, naming specific protein subunits. Um, look at ATP synthase, synthetase, I can't remember, synthetase. Um, it has an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, delta subunit. I think it's a gamma subunit, but it might be a sigma subunit. I can't remember now. <clears throat> Regardless of me remembering biochemistry off the top of my head, where it really shows up as being important for now is that these alpha carbons are actually reactive carbons because they're right next to a carbonyl. Um, most and the most obvious place that you see this is because you make these enols or enolates, and we've talked about those before. Um, but it really is critical now. We're starting to talk about um, about uh, the alpha carbons because the alpha carbons are the ones that can make that um, that other part of the functional group in the enol. And this carbon here winds up having fairly, fairly strong reactivity because of the adjacent carbonyl and the fact that it can form an enol. So just to, uh, to recap for keto enol, Tautomerization. Most of the time, we think of the ketone form as being the most important form. That's the way we draw it usually, right? At equilibrium. Um, however, there are some cases where the enol form can be more common, specifically if you have some sort of stabilization. If you have um, a beta carbonyl, so if you have two carbonyls, one on um, on carbon two here and one on carbon four, those two can interact. If one of them is in the enol form that has that partial positive on the oxygen here, that can form a, a stabilizing force for the other carbonyl, right? Because you've got a strong partial negative on carbonyl and a strong partial positive on the hydrogen. So you can actually get the molecule hydrogen bonding to itself which is favorable interaction, right? So that 
allows it to stabilize itself. So in this case, we actually see that the email form is more common at, at equilibrium. And even if it's not stabilized, even if we only have 0.01% of the molecule is present um, as the enol form, if you have something that can react with an enol, enol then that still might be enough to have a reaction happen. Because remember, these are equilibrium processes, right? So if you have a tiny amount of the enol form, but every time you form the enol, it reacts right away with something else that's present, then you're just going to keep making more enol. It's a little bit like if you um, if you left the cap off of your water bottle. You leave the cap off your water bottle and you leave it outside on a hot day, eventually it's going to all evaporate, right? All the water will be gone, even though it's only evaporating a little bit at a time. But if you put the cap on it, you stop that from escaping, it won't, it, you won't ever wind up with it all evaporating because it reaches an equilibrium and then it stays there. Um, and then this is just the, the going over the mechanism for, for tautomerization again. And we have seen this before, so it's not just mechanism 21.1. I think we saw it back when we first talked about alkynes back in chapter nine, because we made an, an enol when we, um, when we did a, a hydration reaction to an alkyne. And then it right away it rearranged. Um, so this is not the first place we've seen this, but just to recap, if it's an acid catalyzed tautomerization, it's either way, it's just going to wind up being two proton transfers. Um, it's just what proton transfers first depends on if it's acid catalyzed or base catalyzed. Um, and so if it's acid catalyzed, you start by protonating the oxygen. And then the oxygen, the oxygen, um, once it's protonated, you can, you make that cation where you have two resonance structures. And then you can go through just an elimination where you have something that can act as a base that can steal an alpha carbon's hydrogen um, and form the enol. And base catalyzed, like I said, it's the exact same steps, but reversed. You start by pulling off the hydrogen on the alpha carbon. And that makes you, gives you a resonance stabilized anion instead of a resonance stabilized cation. It's an anion because we're under basic conditions, right? And basic conditions mean negative charges are more stabilized. Acid, cat, acid catalyzed means um, positive charges are more stabilized. So even if we only have the enols in really small amounts, they're still very reactive at that alpha carbon. Um, and they can act as nucleophiles, where they wind up with the alpha carbon attacking an electron, um, an electron for a partial positive to act as a, a nucleophile. So what resonance structure? So we started with an enol. So let's just start with the acetone enol. What would be a reasonable resonance structure that we could draw here that would that would account for the alpha carbon acting as a nucleophile? Well, if, the, if there was negative charge on the oxygen, then that would make the oxygen act as a nucleophile, right? So if the alpha carbon is going to act as a nucleophile. 
So that I was aware of the big blue charges. Yeah, so if we if we had a lone pair from the oxygen move down and negative and the, those um, pi electrons move over to the carbon, we get a resonance structure that looks like a positive charge on the oxygen and a negative charge on the alpha part. And now all of a sudden we've got a carbon with a lone pair, essentially. Which means if you had a, something that was a good target for a nucleophile, like let's say just um, um, iodomethane, it would be pretty easy to have that negative charge come over here have this go through an SN2, right? So you wind up with, with really interesting reactions happening because of that enol. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though we wouldn't say that the enol is more present in equilibrium, if you have a small amount of the enol, it can still act as a nucleophile. And if you give it enough time, It'll react. And that's just the prettier figure, the one we just drew. All right, so let's practice showing the enols. So we have three methyl, two butanone. You have two different enols that can form. So draw both of the enols and try to show the mechanism for at least one of them um, under base catalyzed conditions. So starting from 3 methyl 2 butanone. So there's our 3 methyl 2 butanone. What are the two enols that we could form, and how do you get there under basic conditions? Is I still have a little bit of congestion. I'm going to step out and blow my nose real quick. I'll be back in just a minute.
So we've got two alpha particles, right? And we need to have a hydrogen on them in order to make an enol. So if we had a, a quaternary carbon, it's an alpha carbon, that one can't make an enol, right? Or if we happen to have at the, one of the alpha carbons was um, one of the carbons of a benzene ring, it doesn't have a hydrogen it can lose. So under, in those circumstances, you can't have um, an enol forming towards that alpha carbon. So first thing, identify the hydrogens that can be removed. And then you're going to make two, two different intermediates. If you take the red carbon or the hydrogen from the red carbon, you wind up with an intermediate that looks like this, which then has a resonance structure. It's a negative charge. Yes, correct. Thank you. And then just a quick proton transfer step. You get here. And our intermediate, we took our alpha carbon from the green, or sorry, our hydrogen from the green alpha carbon. Point up here, resonance structure then, do the same exact thing. Give us our second email. Right, so those are our two possibilities, and each of them is going to have a resonance structure where they can act as a nucleophile. So both of the two alpha carbons can act as a nucleophile. If we keep these under basic conditions, if we basically, if we don't have enough um, protons around for this second step to happen, it stays as that, that deprotonated intermediate, which is what's called the enolate. So remember, eight just means deprotonated form, right? So carboxylic acids turn into carboxylates, etc. An enolate is a deprotonated enol. And you can think about it as either way, as the oxygen being the OH being deprotonated, or you can think of it as having gone through the elimination, you've lost the hydrogen for the elimination that you haven't made, you haven't protonated the um, oxygen yet. Either way, you make that same, those same two intermediates and they're resonance stabilized. And so they're not as acidic as, um, as a carboxylic acid, but it's not all that, it's not all that hard to deprotonate this. Um, and so with that in mind, we expect these to be more reactive or less reactive than the enols. More reactive, that way. Um, negative charge, right? So we have a, they're better nucleophiles just because you have a full negative charge instead of a partial negative charge. Um, and they also are what are called ambidentate nucleophiles, um, which means they can attack from either of two positions because you have two 
atoms that have that that negative charge two different resonance structures right so the oxygen has a res negative charge on some of the resonance structures the carbon has negative charge on some of the other and the other resonance structure um, so they can either of those two atoms can be a nucleophile um, and ambidente is kind of a funny word but ambi means both right or either like amphibian or ambidextrous um, dentate mean is from the Latin for biting. So literally it can bite, it can bite from either end, um, which might help you remember ambidentate um, can attack from one of two positions, either the carbon or the oxygen. They can, yes. So you do see that in both cases. I think that the enols are, because they're less reactive, they're a little bit more selective about where they um, they mostly just attack from the carbon um, because that oxygen. A, a protonated oxygen that's already staked already has zero charge to it is not as good of a nucleophile. Um, oh, so does it refer to two different types of atoms? That's a good question. I would not. Oxygen and attacking from the carbon, but I was thinking enols can be the same way because they could attack from either oxygen. Oh. Um, so, but not at the same time. Oh. So, because that when you make the enol, you have to pick which alpha carbon is, is it has the double bond. And so you can't have both carbons attacking at the same time. You could have the oxygen or the carbon attacking. But you see it more with enolates because they're more reactive. All right, so let's try drawing the enolate. We draw both resonance structures. So this is going to look a lot like what we just did, right? You're just not doing the second proton transfer step. So try drawing the enolate. And if more than one can be formed, try drawing both. So remember that we do need a hydrogen in order to be able to make an enol um, towards an alpha carbon. So this one is out. Quaternary carbon doesn't have a hydrogen that you can pull off. So we're only going to make one enolate. And you didn't have to draw the mechanism, but if you wanted to, it just looks like a base steals the hydrogen from the alpha carbon and leaves behind the lone pair with a negative charge. And it's just a matter of drawing them. Uh, both resonance structures. And it's probably worth recapping our rules for carbanion stability. So carbanion stability was the exact opposite of carbocation stability. 
So for carbocations, more substituted was more stable, right? With carbanions, less substituted is less is more stable. Um, they don't go through a migration quite like carbocations. We don't need to worry about that at this point, especially given that these enolates are is are resonance stabilized, but that does play a role in which enolate we form. To be the one that puts a negative charge on the less substituted carbon is generally going to be favored. Um, and so we, if we're trying to make an ELA and these resonance structures make it a little bit more favorable than just deprotonating an alkyl carbon normally, but they're still not easy to deprotonate. They both they still have pKa's up above um, what we would normally consider to be pretty strong bases. So hydroxide has pKa um, of around what, 15 is pKa of water. To, to make hydroxide. So you can't use hydroxide um, to readily do this, at least not and get great yields. It was might happen, but go really, really slow and have competing reactions happening. So we would have to, if we want to make these enolates, we do have to use something that's stronger, that's got a higher pKa than these if we want to make them reliably. Um, which means amide is a good choice because amide has a pKa up around 30, I want to say. If our pKa values are similar, then you can have, then you wind up with both forms, both the um, ketone and the enolates are both present at the same time. So if you have a nucleophile and electrophile present at the same time, what happens? Yeah, and so what, what would that look like? What part of the nucleophile is going to be attacking what part of the electrophile. So if the enolate what part of the acetone molecule is going to be attractive to that enolate? Where is the charge portion? So what part of the of the ketone of the acetone is attractive to the enolate? Specifically, you said the charged part, and you're right, but where is the charged part? Are those going to have a partial positive or a partial negative? Um, right. So, what part is so the partial positive? Is the carbon yellow part? Yeah, I did not. Yeah, and if you happen to have the other resonance structure drawn, with it being ambidentate. You can wind up with that reaction happening as well. So you can actually have several different reactions happening just by taking acetone and exposing it to a strong base. You can wind up with a mess of products, one of which would look like.
one that looks like the alpha carbon attaching, or one that looks like the oxygen attaching, and that's that's almost that's like forming the um, acetal that we we talked about before, right? Forming a hemiacetal. but it's going to look a little bit different. But you still have that double bond um, to the alpha carbon. What's that? It looks messy. It, that part, part of that's my drawing, but yes, you, it is messy in that you can get a variety of things happening. Um, and so the the most prompt, so basically we don't really want to use bullet point here is we don't really want to just use another aqueous or another dissolved strong base to do this because it's always going to be an equilibrium reaction. And you're always going to wind up with this sort of side reaction happening where you wind up making these other weird addition products. So if we want to irreversibly convert ketones to enolates, um, we need to do something that makes a hype that makes gas as a byproduct because then it leaves the system. And if it leaves the system, it's not in the equilibrium expression anymore, right? So you can get the reaction to happen irreversibly and convert all of your ketone instead of having a 50-50 mixture and getting all these side products. If you can convert all of it, then you don't get those other side products because you don't have enough of the original material around to react. Um, so sodium hydride is a really common one or sodium metal. So if you just said, Na. That's a really strong reducing agent, though, and so in that case, you might actually wind up with it turning that um, ketone into an alcohol to some extent. Um, so sodium hydride is more commonly used um, because it, that's also a strong reducing agent, but it reduces the um, hydrogen first before it attacks the carbonyl carbon to reduce that. Then you can just brute force it by using a really strong base um, like N-butyl lithium. Um, N-butyl lithium can you make this lithium diisopropyl amide? And diisopropyl amide, or LDA, so this molecule here, it's a very strong base. Um, and n butyl lithium is a solid that's stable enough that you can keep it on, on a shelf. It's not that dangerous to have. So if you use n butyl lithium, um, to, to deprotonate diisopropyl amide, you can make diisopropyl amide, which is a strong enough base that you can do this, um, this reaction essentially to completion. If you look at the pKa values, 19.2 versus 36. So that tells us that that's a difference of 17 pK or pH units, which means that at equilibrium, you're going to favor making the products 10 to the 17th to 1. That's enough that we can say that it happens to completion and we don't have any of this left over. How do I get the difference in the pH units? Uh, six pH units is like it depends on how reactive our starting material is. Like if we're talking about an acid base extraction in lab. Like three pH units is plenty because that's going to give you a, a 1000 to one ratio, right? 10 to the three. Um, and 10 to the three, that still means that 0.1% of it is left in the original state. 
But with those acid base extractions, we're usually doing it a couple times in a row. So if you do, if you leave one, if you leave 0.1% of it behind, and then you do it again, you leave 0.1% of the 0.1%. And now you've left, now you're down to only a million of your starting material is still in its original form. So when you can do it sequentially with an extraction, then two to three pH units is plenty. But when we're talking about these reactions where we need to make sure that there's none of our starting material left or it will react with the products, um, we, want it, we want it to be overkill. So six pH units is, is better and the more the best, the better you can when it comes to that. Um, which is why you can make, if you look at these, these ones, they only have a pH unit that's, it's only a 10 to the three difference and it actually favors the starting material. Um, but you can still consider that to happen because a 1000 to one ratio still means you have a lot of products around just in terms of sheer numbers, right? Um, if, you're, if we're talking about a mole of atoms, you still have 10 to the three, or sorry, 10 to the 20th atoms um, that are products, even if you have a thousand times more of your reactants still. So we, if you're into that, that 10 to the three region, we say it's still an equilibrium reaction, but it favors one side or the other. If you want it to not have any of your reactants around, then 10 to the six is, is a better cutoff. If we have those beta diketones that we mentioned earlier that can self-stabilize, those are a lot easier to deprotonate um, because there's, they have more resonance stabilization. So more resonance stabilization is gonna affect these pKa numbers. And if you think of something like, this one did not as extreme as, actually, If you think about this alpha carbon, if you deprotonate that and make it a negative charge, you have a whole mess of resonance structures that way too, right? Because you have the oxygen that can resonate to, to take the negative charge. The negative charge can also resonate in the benzene ring. So the more resonance that you have, the more stabilized these will be as well. And now that's gonna affect the pKa of that alpha carbon. So I'm actually kind of curious, we built this in mole view, we should actually be able to see. We'll do this and then we'll take a break. Actually, why don't we take, let's start to do a break right now and then I'll look up the pKa. We can see, we can look at these acidities. You don't need to sit there while I'm looking this up. Um, so we'll start the lecture again in, in 10 minutes or so.
can't find the one that specifically looks at comparing PKAs or a table, I mean. Um, but that involves uh, having a phenyl ketone. Um, I did find this practice problem actually though, that has PKAs listed. And so it does show, so this would be PKA of 20, 16, 15, 25, 30. So that it definitely shows that a ketone or that a phenyl ketone is definitely easier to deprotonate the alpha carbon if it's being the alpha carbon is being stabilized with um, something else that can resonate. Um, and so this one's the one that actually doesn't match with the rest of this series because the rest of the series doesn't have resonance involved. It has electron withdrawing group, an electron donating group, and a stronger electron donating group on the other side of the ketone. And so each of those, the more electron density you give that alpha carbon, the harder it is to take the hydrogen off. Um, and the more you pull electron density away from the alpha carbon, the easier it is to take that hydrogen off. And so one of the ways you can do that is with resonance. Another way you can do it is through induction, meaning just having electronegative elements around. Um, I don't know what it would look like if you put fluorines on this carbon, but my, my intuition is that that one would also be really easy to deprotonate. But there might be some different, some other things going on with the resonance that would, might change that a little bit. But either way, um, we got on this tangent because we were looking at this statement down here for a beta doubly stabilized beta diketone. We don't need to use the really big guns. And I did find some other figures that And this, this is just from our textbook. Um, if you just look at a beta beta diketone, because it, ha it has two different resonance structures that can stabilize that negative charge, um, you wind up with a pKa of nine, which all of a sudden now just hydroxide or ethoxide is a strong enough base we could consider this being irreversibly um, deprotonated. So if you have that beta di, um, beta diketones or dicarbonyls, you can have this happening. You don't need the LDA. Right, so this is the figure from the book that shows that. If it's just a regular ketone, and you're trying to deprotonate it, you can use hydroxide or ethoxide, but you wind up with both of these present in equilibrium and they can react with each other. The better option is to use these. However, if it's a beta, or sorry, a yeah, beta diketone that's doubly stabilized, you only need these regular strong bases, not the super strong bases. Um, yeah, you want to look at the synthesis part and we'll, we'll leave. I think that's a good enough place for now. So yeah, let's talk about the synthesis ones. Do you have any thoughts on on any of these? Oh, 
Like you, uh, a sorry, say that again. Um, the I'm trading, I mean, so the lithium, the lithium, copper, yeah, so we would want it to be a metal in this case, though, right? We want to add. Two carbons on, we want it to be an ethyl group. So, but these are just like Grignard reagents in that we can put any R group we want basically on the copper. Because if we put an ethyl group there, then that gives us our. The first thing we would get would be this. So that got us most of the way there. Because that's our ethyl group that we just added. So then we need to just do, we need to go one more step for the reduction. So, and that can just be, so step two could just be sodium borohydride. Followed by, so sodium borohydride followed by uh, a proton source of methanol or water. Because remember those two steps, two and three are really part of the same reaction. You have to start by reducing it with the hydride and then follow that up by adding a proton source so that the oxygen can get rotated. But yeah, that's that's the right approach there. Two is a little tricky. But we don't have to go in order. If you figure out three, but not two, you do three now. Uh, I figured out part two. Okay. Uh, not three. Um, so I started the reaction with uh, With, okay, which which one? I'll pull up the reaction summary. I'm sorry, I don't know all the names. No, that's okay. I don't remember all the names. Or actually, even better, do this one. So you were talking about we're starting from in the bromide, right? Was it one? Was it on this page? Uh, yes. And then I did that one uh, from the one that has the chlorine attached mm -hmm. to the uh, next one over to the the anhydride? Yeah. Okay, so that would take, well, so we don't really have anything here. So I guess if you were making acetic anhydride, that might be one place to go. But if we're starting from bromobenzene, that's not really a, that's not an acid bromide, right? missing the carbonyl part. So we need to do something to start by adding a carbon in here. Um, and this one, I will, 
I'll just be forthright with you. When I was looking at these last night prepping, um, it felt like it'd been a long time since we did these and I was having trouble with it. So I actually went to the solutions manual to refresh my memory. Um, but my first instinct was, and it turned out that this is a good, a good thing to be paying attention to is at the very least, we know we have an extra carbon in there. So we have to do something to add a carbon where the bromine is. And so to add a carbon carbon bond, one of the fir first things you should think of is Grignard reaction. So if you start by turning this into a Grignard re reagent, and then you can expose it to something that has a good leaving group or something that you could reduce. Um, so the way that the, the solutions manual presented it, Do this so I can get to the right chapter quickly. And this one was on 13. Here it is. So we're going to take bromo benzene if we. If we convert it to a green air reagent and then follow that up by, it says to use um, formaldehyde, just a single carbon source. Formaldehyde is easy to reduce by exposing it to a green air reagent because that carbonyl carbon is a good target for a green air reagent. And so you wind up making the, this, um, what's called benzyl alcohol. And then you can use an acid chloride impurity and have that act as your nucleophile because that's a strong enough um, reactive group that you can take an acid chloride and an alcohol and turn it to the ester. And so if you're trying to go backwards from here or to, to work your way backwards from the starting material, you can start by saying, okay, well, I know that that's an acid derivative, right? And I'm trying to make an ester. And the way you make an ester is from a more reactive, um, a more reactive acid derivative reacting with an alcohol. So from, from our starting material, we can say, okay, well, if I had this and I let it react with either of the more reactive ones, either the acid anhydride or the acid chloride, because we actually have acetic anhydride in the stock room. I don't think we have, um, Acetyl chloride. Either of those is more reactive acid derivative than, than the ester. So either the ones in blue could react with the with the alcohol drawn in red to make our final product. So then it means we need to get from our starting material to here. And then that becomes, okay, well, I need to add a carbon where the bromine is. How do I do that? Grignard reagents add carbon, car carbons, things. How could I use a Grignard reagent? And so but this is a particularly tricky one. We usually think of a Grignard reagent as something that we add in later, right? Not what we make from our starting material. But that's just out of convenience normally. 
if, it, if we have something, if we have a bromide that would make a good Grignard reagent, there's no reason that our starting material can't become our Grignard reagent. We just haven't seen it written like that yet. But it's the same reactions we've seen before. Um, if it was, if our starting material was benzaldehyde instead of um, instead of the bromobenzene, then we could do something where we added a Grignard reagent some other way, right? Where we had you know methyl magnesium bromide or something like that. That's why we're used to seeing a Grignard reagent working, right? So come in to our starting material, but there's no reason why our starting material can't be a Grignard reagent. In fact, that's what we did when we did Grignard reagent, right? We took bromobenzene and we made that our starting material. In fact, I think we made very, not quite this reaction, but we used our bromobenzene to react, to make benzoic acids. We did something very similar to this. We added a carbon. And three is really tricky. Three is really tricky because um, if you don't remember one specific name reaction from our, from our, um, I'm actually not sure which chapter was it in. I think it was in chapter 19 where we started looking at acid derivatives, but it was not. Um, either way, um, it was that Bayer Villager oxidation. Because the, remember the Bayer Villager oxidation, what it did was it inserted an oxygen next to a carbonyl. That was the one that had that weird intermediate where it was, where it had um, a four sided ring and you wind up with it shifting over one position and you wind up, remember the migratory aptitude? Talking about that? Yeah. Which in the textbook. I think it was in the aldehydes and ketones section. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was the phosphorus, triphenyl phosphorus. Um, and you wind up with it. No, it was the peroxy acid, the triphenyl, that was the fitting reaction. Um, so it was the peroxy acetic acid. Basically, you need a, a peroxy acid with the extra oxygen and it inserted that extra oxygen in the middle. And it's migratory aptitude was hydrogens followed by the more substituted carbons. So step one here, would look like A peroxy acid to not that's not right that gets us the more substituted carbon shifts over one two. That gets us here. And now once we have an ester, converting an ester to an amide is pretty easy. Although the, the best way to do it is to
So now we can come back to this figure and say, okay, well, if I, if I have an ester and I want to make it namide, I can just expose it to NH3. Or not NH3 in this case, we want it to be the dimethylamine. So step two would just be That's good to know. If you take a step, um, product of step one, you just expose it to CH3 to N. Then you get the nitrogen acting as the nucleophile attacking here, kicks off the, the uh, alcohol you wind up making your product plus isopropyl alcohol. Again, the trick there was remembering variability oxidation. Once you have that, once you have this ester, figuring out how to get the amide is not so tricky. It's at least something we didn't practice it. Um, remembering that that oxidation is the tricky part. All right. We look at this nine thirty. And last thing to talk about is we're going to talk about our first reaction. There's more practice drawing enolates um, and predicting which one is going to be more stable. So it's just all about which one's going to have the lowest pKa, which one is going to be or that has a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. So we'll, we will skip that for now. We'll do that as review on Thursday morning. Um, we'll add one reaction that we can see. And basically this is the mechanisms for these are, for the most part are going to be either the enolate acts as a nucleophile and all of our standard nucleophilic reactions apply, or um, we wind up with the enol acting as an alkene. If you have an alkene, it can go through sub or, uh, addition reactions. Um, although this isn't going to be a true addition reaction, because if we did the addition reaction of bromine to an alkene, we added a bromine to each carbon, right? So it can't be that. So what we are going to wind up seeing is that we do the mechanism in two parts, enol formation followed by halogenation. So if we start by, start with cyclohexanone and make the enol, then we can, we can draw what the enol would, would be attracted to. So I'm just redrawing the cyclohexanone. And our general, I, the general gist is we make the enol, and I'm not showing the steps here yet. And then from the enol, we get our final product. And so if we're under acidic conditions, as it said, H3O plus. Our acidic conditions mean 
that we're going to start by protonating our cyclohexanone. And then from there, we have something to connect as a base. It's going to deprotonate the alpha carbon. That gets us to our email. <clears throat> and remember that the reactive form of our email is almost always going to be that resonance structure where you have a negative charge on the carbon. And if you have the negative charge on the carbon, these halogens are, they're electrophiles, right? They're trying to become reduced, but they're not stable when they're neutral, when they're attached to each other. So we normally think of halides as having a negative charge, but not when they're attached to each other. In their elemental state, they don't have a negative charge, right? because they're being forced to share electrons with each other and they're both just as strong as each other. So that makes the bromine an electrophile. Which gets us to Our final product plus bromide chloride. And as you can see, the yield is not particularly great. Um, only a 65% yield. There are other reactions that can happen at the same time. And none of that is particularly downhill in energy because it's related, because we're making that unstable enol as our intermediate. And then we need the charged resonance structure of that enol to react with the bromine. Um, and one of the things that is interesting about this is this is one of the first times we've actually seen what's called an autocatalytic reaction. Which is when, once the reaction starts, not only does it regenerate the catalyst, it generates more of the catalyst. So the catalyst was a little bit of hydrogen uh, protons to start things off, a little bit of acidity. The reaction will get progressively more acidic as we go because we're not only do we um, wind up regenerating the H plus that we used to start it, we generate extra H plus because we lose the hydrogen there and replace it with the bromine. So these autocatalytic reactions are kind of dangerous in the lab or in industrial chemistry because this is really easy to have a runaway reaction. Because how do you slow down a reaction that catalyzes itself, that generates its own catalyst? So it, it winds up with that being a, um, a bit of an issue sometimes. 
right? And this is the mechanism more neatly drawn than what I had drawn. Make the enol, and then the enol steals a bromine, and then you just do a proton transfer at the end to take that hydrogen off that we started with. All right. So if the alpha carbons are asymmetric, the bromination will preferentially occur at the more substituted carbon. Why might that be the case? Not quite. Um, we did talk about a little bit, but that was with phenolates in the carbon ion. But for the enols, the reactive intermediate looks like. This that's one of the enols or. Or this. So why would this one be favored? I think all the way back to elimination reactions. It was not Markovnikov's rule, it was the other guy. Zaitsev. And Zaitsev said that. The more substituted alkene is more stable. So, because this one is more substituted, you're going to make more of this intermediate. You'll still make some of this, but it'll be the minor product because this is um, tri substituted versus di substituted. Right? So, the um, are basically, this is another case of, of Zaitsev coming back because we don't actually see the alkene in our final product, but because it has to go through the alkene, we know that, that this intermediate is more stable because it's more substituted. But you still have to have a hydrogen you can take off. Right, so more the most substituted up to a point. We don't want to wind up drawing carbon with five bonds. We know that. All right. We'll end there today. We'll start with these for review and some practice on Thursday. And uh, hopefully we'll have at least bring me in lab today to be, but if either way we'll. I'll try to remember to uh, record lab um, so that because it's not a wet lab day anyway today, so you can still get all the information you need. Um, and uh, I will make all of the assignments uh, or the assignment itself for the lab final visible by lab time today. So we'll have more information on that um, at that point.